All right, so this is the fifth lecture in a series about um, religious pluralism, uh, the Greek view of spiritual humanism, and creating an international sustainable civilization today. So let me go over for a second the my list of the lectures since this is the fifth lecture and it's hard to keep track at this point. Um, so the first lecture was about uh, Marif, a book by a highly respected intellectual in Indonesia. He has his book about Islam, humanity, and Indonesian identity. And um, my lectures are partly directed specifically at Indonesians and partly more universal. So for Marif, his background is in Islam, but he himself thinks any of the wisdom traditions in Panchasila are uh, humanistic. So any of those traditions relate to humanity, his view of humanity, which I think is Greek or is compatible. So my work has been on the view of humanity that inspired the Greeks from 800 BC until Aristotle to develop, to have a vision of what it meant to be human. All human beings by nature seek understanding and over time, they developed a culture that gave as many people as possible the most opportunities possible to become fully human. And then Marif ties it back to Islamic uh, Indonesian identity, but these basic foundations can be tied to any national identity and any religious identity. And since these are um, one's national identity, one's religious identity at this point in history is being used to undermine democracies and to divide people. The Greek model is about the development of, you, hum, of humanity that led to the gradual uh, development of their democracy, their free and open society, and then what they did to corrupt it and lose it and elect a dictator. And one of the things they did was to use religion as a weapon. And another thing was to use nation nationalism as a weapon to divide people, create chaos. And so an authoritarian um, dictator was uh, voted in and they lost their free society. So that's the overall theme. Then I talked about Aristotle's personal and social virtues. On the third one, it was his political virtues. Then I applied those virtues to the problem of corruption, which is true in any culture. And then today, I'm going to apply it to the problem of terrorism. So that's the, that's the goal today. Um, this is Applying Aristotle's theory of virtues and vices to the issue of terrorism. So I was invited to give a lecture on terrorism at a conference, and I felt like I don't know anything about it. Um, but they wanted it to be an international conference, so I needed to be there. But then I just thought, okay, I'll give Aristotle's virtues because anybody who has a specific situation involving terrorism should have this broader context within which they're making a decision. They also need the broader context of their own particular history and nation and uh, religious tradition because that uh, brings in nuance and it would affect specifically what they might do in that particular case. But the problem in general is true for any every country in the world at this point. So we have the virtues, self-control, the ability to go from the habits you're born with to reason as the foundation for your behavior and your way of life. Greed is a political evil. 
and it nurtures terrorism. This is really important because in the United States especially, greed is honored much more. Uh, I think it's much more than there's any reason to justify, and Aristotle was very much against greed. It undermines political association, and it's the number one factor in losing a free society. Um, the Why? Because the rich money sticks to money, and then you get an underclass. The poor are desperate. The middle and upper classes get distracted because they have all these pleasures that corporations make money off of. They're unnecessary pleasures. Um, and then um, they start spending money on these pleasures and they don't want to pay taxes and they don't want to help educate or lift up the underclass. And then you've got trouble. Courage is our reactions to fear and vulnerability. And uh, we are very vulnerable. And in the last decade or so, people have become more and more aware of their vulnerability because the globalization process was supposed to lift all boats for the bottom two thirds was supposed to be lifted up and that has not been happening. And so there are a lot of people who are afraid and then they're very vulnerable to power hungry political operatives. Um, if people don't choose to prevent the problem of vulnerability, politicians can use fear to gain power. So the military can take over, the rich can take over in the name of security, but they're actually um, in the name of freedom. Um, they take over, but it, it, it doesn't show, right? They don't let you see that the politicians are actually just puppets of the rich or that the military are puppets of the rich. They just call it freedom. At least in my country, they do. Um, in George W. Bush, so I have examples from my country on this one. After 9-11, he used the fear of terrorism to redesign our society. And underneath all this fear of terrorism, and we need more guns, uh, the rich were actually restructuring our tax system, our economic system, our housing system, our education. Everything was getting restructured to favor the rich. And um, this, in, this led eventually to Trump, who's even more extreme, but the Bush administration really set it up because they made the lives of the bottom two thirds even more precarious and difficult. And so Trump appealed to that. Um, now, political courage. Political courage is where a politician takes the courage, risks losing a reelection just to try and educate the public and to tell them, you know, that what they should be afraid of and what they shouldn't be afraid of and presenting a plan and appealing to reason rather than appealing to fear. And so uh, it takes political courage to say, dropping more bombs is not going to solve this problem. So when it comes to China, for example, we, should, we fear China, we should worry more about our economic development, our technology development, rather than getting us all focused, obsessed about whether China is going to take over Taiwan and we have a war. We will get even farther behind in the economic contest for the next wave of technology and the next wave of green energy. So it takes political courage at this point to say, no, we don't have that to fear. We have this to deal with. We need to compete with the Chinese. We don't need to be afraid of them. 
Um, we need to work with other countries and admit that we alone can't fix it. Uh, not one authoritarian leader will not fix our problems. And one country working together in some way is not going to fix the problems of Russia, China, um, the Israel and Palestine, you know, we have to work with other countries. Another issue that's related to fear is anger. Um, how should a political leader um, appeal to anger, express outrage, but respond with a plan? And how do you avoid taking revenge? Because taking revenge only creates more terrorists. So what happened in the U.S., Right after 9-11, a lot of people were felt sorry for the U.S. We had a lot of allies. But then we went in there. We went to Europe and said, you're for us or against us. We're going to take revenge. We're going to invade Iraq. Nobody, no other countries wanted us to invade Iraq. Britain, Tony Blair was the only one that stood beside us. We bribed a few other smaller countries, but I think there were six countries. Tony Blair did just because of the history of how close Britain is, and he lost all of his political capital. He did not get reelected, even when he had been very popular. So for us to take revenge was exactly the wrong thing to do. It was an overreaction, and it was actually motivated by money. So... The number one takeaway to me from the Bush administration was he used that event to miseducate Americans. He created this model for war on terror to structure the society as the rule of the rich, to find these bad guys. And anybody who questioned what he did were terrorist super um, sympathizers. Uh, and I guess people listening in Indonesia or elsewhere, we'll have to figure out what's the analogy. How is it that a power-hungry politician in Indonesia or somewhere will find this bad guy to blame? And I think it's like the Chinese Marxists. Um, they're, you know, that justifies massacres or it justifies centralization of power. Um, there's a rhetorical strategy. So it wasn't just Indonesian leaders, they use God to defend their revenge. They use patriotism to distract people from being exploited. And, or they use God as punishing us for our evil ways. And then um, defending a return to the good old days or blaming the liberals, the progressives. And this happened around the world too. Uh, Jerry Falwell said God allowed 9-11 to happen because our country was getting taken over by the feminists, the gays, the moral relativists, whatever. Um, and that's just a way to score points against the political party that you disagree with. Now, my view of what the Democrats are really about is to tax the rich to provide education and healthcare for the bottom two thirds, to create a more stable lifestyle. That's what the, Democ the Democratic Party has always been about, trying to create a middle class. Um, certainly at that time, that was true. Some other things have come up recently, but. Okay, generosity. So how do you set up programs for economic development? How are you gonna solve this problem? To appeal to fear doesn't work. To appeal to pleasure, fantasies, distracting people doesn't work. What works or what is a good strategy? Well, try to set up programs for economic development within your country so that you have more stability in your country and a terrorist event doesn't polarize people within your own country and also um, don't reward terrorist attacks by giving potential terrorists more social advantages than others, 
but provides citizens with the opportunity to create a stable middle class lives for themselves. So they'll want their nation to be stable. They won't want a politician to say, you know, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to break what we have and create something totally new. You don't want people to become desperate enough so that they'll go for some Hail Mary, some just breaking the system. Aristotle is very much against destabilizing. Um, but you have to give two thirds, the lower two thirds opportunities for creating stable middle-class lives and they'll be invested in the system and they're not going to want a politician who's going to want to break it. Um, so developed nations should create programs of economic development in the developing nations so that they have hope and they can gain stability and the nation should bind together. So after 9-11, the U.S. should have found all of its allies and worked together to isolate the terrorists of the world. But instead, we went in and said, our way or the highway, we isolated ourselves and we alienated all sorts of other countries from us, which is just continuing now. But, you know, that was a huge mistake right after 9-11. Rational humor, try to find ways to have a sense of humor so you don't get so fearful or so obsessed, sort of make jokes about people that are clearly um, way too phobic, way too afraid. Um, don't create the impression that all rulers are incompetent, uh, leading to distrust and cynicism. So Whenever uh, a citizen says the government is terrible, it's just when you say that, you're going to elect the worst leaders because whoever has the most persuasive rhetoric, which is usually the rhetoric that appeals to fear or fantasies the most, you know, the most um, cynical, inaccurate rhetoric will win if you really think they're all equally bad. They're not. Expose the use of terrorists to justify takeovers of power. Expose what's going on under the surface. Get citizens to think critically and keep an issue in perspective. Avoid obsessing or blaming terrorists for all of our social problems. Again, that could any country can make this mistake. Put up with minor slights in order to stay focused on important goals. Um, avoid petty power struggles between the military, the intelligence, and the diplomats. And this happens in our country. I don't know if it happens in your country, but people will withhold information. Like the military might know something and they don't tell the FBI. <laughs> or the FBI doesn't tell the military and they need to coordinate. Um, and then also the diplomats need to know what the FBI and the CIA know um, in order to actually engage diplomatically. They need to know if the other country is actually acting in good faith, if what they're saying is accurate. So we have to have good intelligence, but they have to work together. Um, Muslims throughout the world avoid responding to irrational prejudice with animosity and violence. They create bonds of goodwill and trust through the community activities, interfaith dialogues, volunteer. Okay, so Muslims throughout the world should um, work together, show the world that they're humanitarian and people won't be afraid of them. Um, don't, you know, uh, get paranoid about prejudice against them. Just show people, no, we're very humane. Um, okay, non-Muslims should know the importance of creating a culture that does not demonize Muslims. Okay, and that again, um, 
George W. Bush at first was for a week or two wanted to meet with uh, American Muslims, communicate to the public that Muslims in America are patriotic, they're not terrorists, but within a week or two, as soon as Dick Cheney, his vice president, and his little group wanted to use 9-11, and they said this, they knew it wasn't Osama bin Laden, but they wanted to use it. And they knew it, well, it was Osama. They knew it wasn't Saddam Hussein who did it, but they had always wanted an excuse to go into Iraq. And they said that in an email. We'll use this as an excuse. We'll get the public to associate this with uh, Saddam Hussein, and then we will invade Iraq. They wanted to invade Iraq for a number of years because they want to go in and get cheap oil. So it was really all about cheap oil. And it led to this horrible uh, division of the world. And we're still living with the consequences of all of that. So that's the wrong way to deal with terrorism. Um, there's many ways leaders can prevent it. And once it happens, there's many ways that they can avoid overreacting or getting the public to overreact. Make good decisions. Okay. So keep a good ruler would keep encouraging the citizens to think about your talents, develop them, go get the education you need, manage your career in a way that promotes the well-being of all Indonesians. So after a terrorist attack, you could say there might be some people out there who think they have a real talent for intelligence gathering to prevent terrorism. There might be people who are teachers who want to make sure this event uh, students don't feel afraid. They still want to go on and live good lives. Just every single job and the climate of the country would be affected by an event like this. And so when a young person is figuring out what job they want, what they feel called to do, that would be included in what would they, they would want to envision as part of their job is to link together with moderate Muslims and moderate uh, representatives of all the religious traditions and create a solid middle class. So um, you want to have a meritocracy. People have positions of power because they've proven that they're good at exercising that particular type of authority. Um, on the, I mean, the alternative is if the power, people who have power have it because of their family or their, their family's name, their reputation, or their wealth, then if that's the reason a young person gets appointed to a job, they're incompetent. They haven't proven their competence. And then they're more vulnerable to a terrorist attack. They're not going to be doing their job well, or they're going to be using their job to help their family and friends, which creates an unstable, unstable society. And then terrorists can come. And then, and also a terrorist attack can further divide the public against each other. Um, rational honor, know which way of life and choices promote collective well-being as opposed to fear of some enemy, okay? Terrorism, um, so you wanna make sure to honor security forces, honor the police and the military, but also you have to honor people who prevent future terrorist attacks. So you wanna honor the intelligence community, the diplomacy community and the community engaged in economic development, okay? So all of those, the citizens need to have this picture in their head of how all the pieces fit together. 
So you can't, you can avoid an ambitious politician from using terrorism to justify setting up a military state. Um, don't honor violent responses to violence. So uh, don't think the only answer to violence is more violence. The answer would be intelligence and diplomacy. Um, okay. All right, another thing that um, a terrorist attack, a good political leader is not going to use cynical rhetoric. They're going to speak to the people in a way that can educate them. It's a teachable moment, right? So the media will use terrorism as a sensationalist story because then they get viewers and they gain money. But a politician, a good leader, will communicate with citizens. So the sensationalist media will not dominate the understanding of the problem. A good leader will use terrorism as a model for why citizens should be informed about issues, why they should keep talking to each other, why they should learn how to get along. Because um, when a terrorist attack serves to divide us against each other, we're more vulnerable to more attacks. How do you create laws which contain the problem? Okay, so how do you create a whole structure that can prevent terrorist attacks? Um, that's the overall goal, is to prevent them in the future rather than take revenge about the past. Don't overreact. Have the same punishment for the same crime. Uh, distribute goods and services to prevent and have a continual flow of information about the situation. Um, also, the type of situations that are most likely to breed terrorism. Um, and then a good political leader will, and Congress will offer opportunities to motivate people to stop, um, to be engaged with the society rather than um, alienated from it. Um, how do you um, rectify wrongs when people do break the law? Well, you shouldn't focus on taking revenge. Ambitious politicians will use it to gain power and they'll justify excess punishments. So um, that happened in the US with uh, prisons in Cuba. Uh, Abu, let's see. Guantanamo Bay, and we we actually arrested a number of people who were not guilty at all, but the Bush administration did it because they wanted to give the impression to the American public that they were doing something, even they were finding all these terrorists and terrorist sympathizers and throwing them into prison. They had no lawyer. They didn't have a right to a fair trial. And it turns out, you know, very few of them were guilty. And so what do you do with these people? Because if you release them, they probably will become terrorists. Certainly they'll be sympathetic, sympathetic to any kind of anti-American uh, movements after they've gotten treated like that. So you're just making more terrorists. Um, Terrorists can mingle in society. They they aren't clearly identified soldiers representing a national country. So terrorism is a different kind of conflict, but it's even more important not to overreact and even more important to have a good intelligence agency being aware of where these terrorists might be, who they might be. Um, so in the courtroom, when you apply the laws, the lawyer shouldn't appeal to fear and prejudice to get either a judge or a jury to um, give a harsher punishment, but also exaggerated threats would cause the public 
to be more afraid than they really need to be. Okay, so the judges should have the same procedures, same burden of proof. The public needs to find out, you know, what's going on, whether these trials are legitimate or whether our country's been given over to fear mongering and excess overreaction. Um, allow the public to demonstrate if they think that the authorities are not behaving appropriately. And I was involved in a number of demonstrations against the way the people in Guantanamo Bay were being treated. It wasn't solving the problem. I read a book uh, years later, a few years ago, called the, the Dark Side, about our torture program. It's a 350-page book documenting all the things we did. And we did not get good information, but we did create a lot more terrorists, a lot more people who hate us. And we did divide our country internally among the people who said we shouldn't treat people that way and the people who thought we're soft on terror. It was very divisive. It was not handled well. The Bush administration made everything worse, starting about three weeks afterwards. Um, police should not use aggression to threaten the protesters. That also happened. And um, the police should be well-trained in how to use restraint, even when the citizens overreact, because they do have the power and the guns they can use guns uh, with impunity and not get arrested, but they're the ones that really need the training not to do that. Um, what about the intellectual virtues, sciences? We can use the sciences and scientific methods to gain legitimate evidence about what's going on. We can use the social science to understand the kinds of conditions and the types of personalities who are most likely to become terrorists and also most likely to believe bad rhetoric. And then we need to educate our people that history has shown this is the kind of rhetoric you don't want to listen to. Social sciences shows these are the kind of personalities you don't want to become like this. You do want to identify people who are like that. And you, and you need to avoid listening to them. One pretty well-known book is called The True Believer, a certain kind of personality type that will believe false rhetoric. Um, science and technology are, should be used to develop complex monitoring devices and a global network of information and surveillance. So we should have gotten together with all of our allies and additional allies. We, we could have had a huge global network of technology where the non-terrorist countries had a, a huge system of information and surveillance to isolate terrorists. And we did not do that. Instead, we isolated ourselves. Okay, so practical wisdom. The object of wish, this is where the Bush administration got it wrong, right from the beginning. The whole foundation was wrong. Eliminating terrorism is an impossible goal. There's no, you can't go from that goal to any sort of specific policy about what the military should do or the police. It just meant we threw a whole lot of money into these enterprises. We started a whole new department in the cabinet, the Department of Homeland Security. It hasn't made us more secure. Um, it, and it costs a lot of money. It's just another bureaucracy. Um, what are the options? Starting a, a Bureau of Homeland Security was not uh, a thoughtful option. It was just an overreaction. Um, choose the best option for the right reason. Always trying to keep a stable middle class. Again, this Homeland Security is more taxes, more deficits. This is what America has been doing. Um, 
giving the reasons necessary to create a history of what has been done in the past and why, and which choices were better and why. Another thing Americans don't do, they don't bother to keep in mind even recent history. Um, I don't think my students have any idea what was going on during the Iraq war or why people voted one way or the other. They could, they don't even know what their parents thought. And so nobody's learning anything from either their successes or their failures. I cannot imagine what else is there that a person needs to know than this history of how their country has dealt with opportunities and, and threats. I certainly hope in Indonesia and elsewhere that K through 12, college, out of college, uh, public education is seriously, um, there's a serious effort to educate citizens so they can make good judgments about political affairs and also so they can identify political leaders that are making better and worse judgments. Okay, so it's possible. There's so many ways that this process of trying to educate the public gets corrupted. So money for security gets wasted because the public is okay. Go ahead, give them all this money and we'll be safer. And it doesn't make you safer. Um, professionals can overcharge for their services. That happened with the vice president had a company named Halliburton and Halliburton was given government contracts to rebuild Iraq. And they, it was a no bid contract. They didn't have to compete with anybody. They also squandered a lot of money and they got caught for overspending. Four times they got caught and still, when uh, Hurricane Katrina hit, they got the contracts for that too, because that was George Bush's vice president who really wrapped our country around his finger and got very rich. So, and that was not counted corruption. I think that's funny because the US ranks high, you know, uh, ranks as a relatively uncorrupt government compared to some developing countries, but <laughs> this is legal. Like what we do in another country might be, what should be called corruption and it's legal for us. Um, good judgment. So you discuss issues with other people. So the citizen should be having conversations about um, judgments that other people with power have made. Even if the citizens don't have the power, they need to educate themselves and each other. They need to recognize that they depend on each other, not to be corrupt and to have practical wisdom. And they need to know their personal lives are not separated from social and political well being. They have to keep their own house in order. And they have to unite faith and reason. So however you understand God, religious pluralism, God is the source of order and the intelligibility of nature and culture. So that in the human condition, some aspects of nature and culture don't change. There are these patterns, virtues and vices, types of situations, types of decisions. So our minds are structured to be able to recognize these. Now you can say God created the universe, God created human beings with that intention in mind, or you can say it's just the product of evolution. And so Greek humanism has been used to, to support either one of those positions. It, it does not discriminate based on the categories we have about secular humanism versus religious humanism. So that's why I call it spiritual humanism, which is you're living for the sake of something greater than yourself, 
among those things is the well-being of your society. And that's what the Greeks have to offer, how to preserve a democracy. So you have to um, think that God wants you to deliberate well. God created a universe that's understandable. We evolved able to understand it. God wants us to use reason to learn from these patterns, to learn from our mistakes and our successes. So we have a responsibility to God and to each other. And we have, we can, and we need to condemn terrorism, especially when it's justified as God's will. And in the U.S., we needed to call out this anti-terrorism, war on terrorism, and this takeover by the rich and the military industrial complex getting richer and richer. We have to condemn that also, especially if it's done in the name of God, because it's cynical. It's not. People behind it are into money. They're not into faith. We can study the history of terrorism and develop successful ways to address it. We're intended, either by evolution or God, to use all these powers. Um, to combine Aristotle's perspective with all the major religious traditions. If we unite reason and faith, it's a powerful force for rejecting terrorism, not justifying it. Okay. Um, it enables citizens to identify power-hungry politicians. Uniting faith and reason is the best way to get to create a culture that is would be approved of by any god in any of the religions and also by secular hum humanitarian people. Um, the problem of evil has comes up a lot in the religions. Why didn't God stop this? Why doesn't God prevent evil? Why do we have evil? Well, the answer to that, which is, legitimate for any religious tradition is that a universe that includes a creature that can understand and appreciate the creation is better than a universe without that kind of creature because we can actually appreciate the universe, um, which is unique. Uh, a universe with a creature that knows it can choose, it's the same creature as soon as we understand we can appreciate the creation, we also know we can exploit it. We can, we can do a lot of things. So we're aware that we have a choice. Um, and we can follow the patterns that wise people have passed down to us, or we can ignore them, reject them. A universe with a creature with free will and the uh, with the power of reason to know how to use it is better because it includes righteousness, which is choosing to do what's best because it's best. And uh, justice, choosing to use the power we have for the well-being of others. Uh, when we have options. And um, so the idea of a final judgment makes sense um, to think that someday we should be judged because the world doesn't necessarily reward justice or punish injustice. So the concept of an ultimate judgment makes sense. It's just that it also is perfectly fine for a secular humanist to say, well, I think if you really are humanitarian, you don't worry about ulterior motives, reward or punishment. You just worry about doing the right thing. So somebody who's a humanist and say, I, am I have dedicated myself to practical wisdom and I'm totally indifferent to what would happen after I die, or I'm totally convinced that I'll die and that'll be it. And a person who thinks God wants us to have good judgment, to promote well-being, and that's what would be rewarded, those people can work together. There's nothing that should divide them. And 
It's when um, religion gets used as a divider between people that you really have trouble. But there's no reason for a commitment to practical wisdom and human well-being uh, is what a God would want, what a humanitarian would want, and you can avoid people who abuse uh, reason and faith. The universe is perfect. God cannot intervene in ways that control free will, or it would no longer be free will, right? Um, God could punish after death, but cannot undermine the natural and social order we've established. The whole reason for punishment is we actually have free will. Um, the best natural and social order includes the opportunity for deliberate evil and human ignorance. But we're responsible for becoming wise and seeking wisdom. It's not God's fault. God allows terrorism because of free will. Terrorism is a perversion of free will. It's evil, and we know that. All the major religious traditions condemn terrorism. Even though terrorists use God, use their religious traditions to justify it, it's a complete perversion of the tradition. The great spiritual leaders exercise the virtues as Aristotle defines them, the theories and the stories that are passed down inspire human behavior, this kind of human behavior flourishing. Um, all right, so what about Panchasila? Belief in God, Aristotle's view of God and virtues can serve as a way to explain why um, principle number one is true. Indonesian political philosophy is based on the union of reason and faith. It rejects religious intolerance and religious terrorism. In the USA, religious toleration is not an Indonesian view. So in the USA, in our political ideology, we completely we don't have an official state religion, none. So in, in Indonesia, you have many official state religions. So it's a different approach. Um, in the USA, religion is the source of animosity. It's creating a lot of problems. But that was why our founders said, you can, you can have whatever opinions you can at church, but you cannot act that way when you're being a citizen. Whereas in Indonesia, to be a good Indonesian citizen is also to tolerate religions, not to separate them from citizenship. You can identify as a Muslim, but as a moderate, as a humanist Muslim. Okay, principle number two, the politicians have got to be involved in developing programs and institutions to develop our humanity, the citizens' humanity. The USA has a minimal government model. Just a free society really has meant no insufficient regulations on capitalism, on the economic system. Number three is Indonesian unity. So that would be goodwill and trust. People have goodwill toward each other and they trust each other. So religious belief should nurture this, the desire for unity, empathy, a common humanity, uh, and it can get used for the opposite. Um, internationally, there's different nation states, but the same basic religions. Um, and of course, this kind of animosity is also becoming international. In Sri Lanka, there's uh, Buddhist versus Muslim. In India, there's Hindu versus Muslim. In many countries, uh, Myanmar, it's Buddhist versus Muslim. So religion at this moment is being weaponized all over the world, which is another reason why it's important to bring in Aristotelian humanism, Greek humanism, or spiritual humanism. The view of spirituality and systems thinking is uh, a notion of integration of emotions, actions, a way of life. 
and it's very humanistic. And also sustainability is really important. And it was in the Greeks also. The wisdom through deliberation. So the image of a society is people gathered around a table, contributing different points of view, get, getting a complete idea of a problem, listening to conflicts and grievances, and collect, collectively making a decision. This is a very, very good aspiration. So in Indonesia, you'd have people from every one of those religious traditions at the table. In the US, we tend to not um, value that as a major issue because we're supposed to be able to separate our religion from our ability to deliberate uh, for better or worse. But anyway, Deliberating around a table is really important. Um, principle number five, once a decision is made, leaders can persuade people to act on it because citizens recognize the need for compromise. Um, unjust politicians don't let them manipulate people using fear or religion. Um, Every major religious tradition has a tradition of social justice and questioning leaders in the name of higher principles. So every uh, Muslim humanist should always make their leaders, whatever religion the leader identifies with, accountable, transparent and accountable for what they do and what they say. Um, all major religions include some kind of theology, which is a logos of God, an explanation of the highest good, rituals, mysticism, and social justice. Um, religion tends to be conservative because the children from age one to 15 or so go through the same phases, but Social justice religion is a great benefit because citizens can then question rulers for the right reason in the right way and prevent authoritarianism. So there are two reasons for, for people to question the leaders. Uh, and one of them is because you want to create a rebellion and you're power hungry and you want to destabilize or blow up the society and take over which is what Steve Bannon is doing at this moment. Or the other reason is for religious leaders, leaders who, and also humanitarian, people who have stellar reputations as the highest moral quality, highest uh, virtue, uh, character for practical wisdom. And when they question a government, their questioning their problems their argument should be trusted and they can lead people ahead because the world is always changing and so to refuse to change is going to get people behind it's going to shrink the middle class because people aren't adapting to the economic changes and at this point to the weather changes uh, lots of changes. So we've got to have somebody leading the change. It should be leaders who have a reputation for being extremely righteous and just. Um, social change can lead to instability. So it has to be led by virtuous citizens in the name of God, or if you have a certain, in Europe, you could probably do it in the name of humanitarianism. Um, because of the European history. Citizens need to stay informed, not apathetic, um, and they shouldn't get sucked into movements caused by fear or other irrational motives, jealousy, whatever. Um, we have a responsibility to God to be engaged, citizens, um, or we have a responsibility to our own humanity um, as a way to affirm our, our nature. Either way, it's the same behavior. The five pillars are compatible with Islam, five pillars of um, uh, Islam. 
So belief in God, Muhammad is the prophet. Muhammad was tolerant. Um, he did not require or even justify intolerance. Then the second pillar of prayer is to live an examined life, avoid impulsive behavior. So that would naturally lead to a more reflective, philosophical way of living. Um, giving charity, that's very important. Aristotle's virtue of generosity. All the major religious traditions promote generosity because it develops trust and goodwill and stability. Fasting, this is another one that promotes self-control, um, gaining control over that basic drive, pleasure drive, the hunger drive. So that's a good foundation for avoid, avoiding greed, sloth, vices, a lot of other vices. Um, so the two most important virtues are self-control and generosity. The most important ones for creating a community and, and Muhammad's five pillars really do cultivate those virtues. The pilgrimage to Mecca, Indonesians can learn about other nations with Muslims, compare their stories. They can inform Muslims about the kind of moderate Islam united with democracy in Indonesia. I think they, they should actually speak up for their tradition rather than listening to other people um, if those other people's Muslim tradition is tied to Mideast oil or the tribalism in the Mideast or the Sunni Shia, you know, war going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia. There's a lot of problems with Islam in the Mideast that Indonesia doesn't have. So I think Indonesians need to recognize that these other countries are wealthy, they are powerful, but they they don't necessarily have a better understanding of Islam, that's for sure. They might, I would guess, if you had to take a guess, it's probably worse. Um, but there's chance for cross-cultural communication. Um, in, okay, so Indonesians don't only accept being Muslim and democratic, they embrace it, right? They think you can't be a good Muslim if you're forced to obey. So the countries in um, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, these countries, Qatar, are not, uh, you know, the people who are Muslims there have ulterior motives. And so Indonesian Muslims, just in general, are more authentic, or they should be, simply because they have a choice. They don't have to, to um, be Muslim. They can still, in theory anyway, get have the same privilege, the same protections, the same government protections and laws against discrimination. So, um, so the only legitimate exercise of Islam is within a cultural context that allows and even forces people to have free choice to take responsibility for who they are. So this is a more sophisticated culture actually than um, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates. Um, so what's the place of Indonesia? Uh, the development of global civilization is pluralistic. There's not one way to be a democratic society. There's not one philosophy. Indonesia's political philosophy is well suited to the new realities. Um, it always can be corrupted, no problem. But Indonesia can lead the way in rejecting terrorism in the name of Islam, for sure. Um, and every nation needs Indonesia to be a model for others to just contribute. Well, here's our model, maybe you can gain something. Um, and, and the US really needs Indonesia to succeed because it's hard for all of us to keep our democracies going. Now, when I originally wrote this lecture, my country was not 
as much on the verge of losing its democracy as it is at the moment in 2024. So we need Indonesians to cling to save their democracy and maintain their democracy even more than we did when I wrote the lecture. So, um, so finally, this is true for every country. Every country in the world has to deal with either terrorism or enemies at the border or enemies, um, you know, some sort of enemies. So the word terrorist is sort of like uh, people that your country's leaders feel threatened by. Now they might actually be threats. They might be the way the politicians find an enemy in order to unite the country. So the issue of quote unquote terrorism is true for every country in the world. And how do you deal with it? And I think starting with Aristotle's virtues and vices, you can get a general perspective and it can not only help you deal with situations, it can help you deal with how to explain to the public, how to educate the public so that you can prevent these sort of events in the future and create a strong social fabric and um, threats or attacks by other countries or by terrorists would not divide your country. Uh, the U.S. is a very good example of what not to do. <laughs> and um, I wish you well. I wish Indonesians well. I wish people from any country well, but I also pray for my own country because we are still in the throes of the after effects of 9-11. But, you know, all of this stuff is related to our history, but it's also related to the human condition. So we're all in this together.